Father, I just ask you tonight for a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of your son. I ask you to open up the eyes of our hearts tonight that we would see your son rightly. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus, we exalt you tonight. There's no one like you. You stand head and shoulders above the rest. We love you in Jesus' name. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, let's just open to Revelation chapter 1. We are starting six weeks in the book of Revelation until Labor Day, okay? So we're going to go one through five only, maybe a little bit more, but um, right up until Labor Day. So this is our new series, How You Like Me Now, back. Guess who's back? Anyways. Um, all you new people are like, what are you even talking about? Hi, my name's Brian for all, half the room. Um, I, this, th- these last few weeks, I've, ha- I've had some time to, I was away for a little bit and um, just feeling deep love actually for our church community, deep love for, for Upper Room Denver, for, for who God has called together in this place. And, and just um, this whole time I, I've been in the book of Revelation, Revelation 4 and 5 particularly, just as we were in our own prayer room relaunching some of our summer sets and, and what we are doing up there in the third floor of this building. If you don't know, we do a prayer room morning, noon, night, um, or not morning and night right now, uh, Monday through th- Monday. Well, I, it was up there, so you saw it earlier. <laughs> it's up there. Um, but, but just seeing Jesus as the one seated on the throne. And, you know, the prayer that the Lord teaches us when the disciples ask, ask him to teach us how to pray, you know the prayer. He starts by saying, Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Right? He starts by, by causing us to lift our eyes up to see Jesus on the throne. Or the Father on the throne. <laughs> Jesus is praying, obviously. And, he says to, and the Father on the throne. Our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. Three different times in Scripture. Maybe there's more, but I, I've just found three different times in Scripture. You see Jesus himself lift his eyes to the Father in prayer. What's he looking at? He's not just looking up at the sky. He knows where his Father is seated. He knows that where he is right now, and he's praying to him. And the three times, you know, just for fun, it's when he feeds the 5,000, when he raises Lazarus from the dead, and right when he enters into the high priestly prayer in John 17, it says he lifts his eyes to the heavens. And... The next part of the Lord's prayer is, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we pray that prayer and we just pray it almost like recitation. We just know it. If you grew up in the church, you grew up reciting that as a little kid even. And that's one of the first prayers you probably learned to pray because it's the Lord's prayer. So he says, when you pray, pray this way. Teach us how to pray. So he says, when you pray, pray this way. And so we pray this way. And sometimes it becomes so familiar to us that we strip it of its meaning of what Jesus was actually commanding us to pray. He wasn't just saying, oh, Lord, please just let your kingdom come. He was actually saying it in the imperative, pray it this way. Come, thy kingdom. Come, thy will. Let it be done on the earth as it is in heaven. But if we don't know what's going on in heaven, how will we ever pray? How will we ever ask him to do that which he's doing in the heavens to do it here on earth, here in Denver? And so these next few weeks, I just want to lift our eyes, get our eyes to, to readjust and get into focus To see Jesus rightly as the one, as the lamb who was slain, seated on the throne. And that if we can almost get a new prescription for the lens in which we see life and in which we see God, in which we see his son, that if we can get a new lens to see him rightly, that things will begin to change in your lives. Because what apocalyptic literature does, which is the book of Revelation, is it tells us that things are not as they seem. 
that things are more than they seem. I think so many of us, when we, when we look at the book of Revelation in particular, I get it, a lot of you are like, oh man, we did Song of Solomon, and now we're doing Revelation. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. But, but, but I want you to get this, because I feel like we've peddled in fear when preaching the book of Revelation, not realizing that the church is actually victorious in the hour of greatest trouble. I think so many times we think this is when the church is just defeated and you just have to hold on until Jesus returns. And if you can just do that by the skin of your teeth, you're going to make it. What I want to tell you is that the book of Revelation actually tells you that this is the church's finest hour. That when trial and tribulation comes, this is when the church is going to shine brightest of all. And so I just want us to look at this because I think so many times we think it's only about future events. And it is about future events. You're going to read in the first three verses. That's what, what, what John writes right in the beginning saying this is about future events. But he doesn't start there. He starts simply with this. He says in verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ. See, when we're reading this letter, this is actually the longest letter that you're going to find in the New Testament. We sometimes read it as a mere historical curiosity, like, oh, this is a little bit different than the rest of the letters in the New Testament. So, you know, it's it's in a different category or different genre in how we're supposed to read this. But John had a very intentional purpose in sending this letter to seven churches on the western coast of the Turkey, modern-day Turkey, what he calls Asia Minor later. But what we know as modern-day Turkey today, there are seven churches within just a few hundred-mile distance separated from each other where John is writing this letter specifically to these seven churches, with these seven churches in mind. And what you have to understand is the context, and we're going to get there in verse 10, but the context of the book of Revelation is a unique context that John is writing when he's sending this letter to these seven churches. But I don't want you to be robbed of actually seeing Jesus the way he's meant to be seen through the book of Revelation or the letter of Revelation. When he starts with the revelation of Jesus Christ, in some translations it starts with the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. And because of how that name or that word has become something else, it's like apocalyptic. It's all negative. It's all bad. But all apocalypsis, apocalypsis is actually the word there, but apocalypse is what we translate it in the English language. All that means is the unveiling, the disclosure, the full disclosure of Jesus Christ. Here's the understanding, is if Jesus is veiled to our eyes and veiled to our minds, if you'll read this letter, that suddenly he can pull the curtain back and you can see Jesus the way he was meant to be seen. So in Revelation of Jesus Christ, and he says this, which God gave him to show his servants, still verse 1, things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. And then he says this in verse 3. No other scripture has this promise tied to it. But he says, blessed is he who reads. And those who hear the words of this prophecy. And keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. There is actually a specific blessing. So even if you don't read, I'm, I'm going to ask you to read Revelation 1 through 5 the ne these next six weeks between Sunday church services, okay? But even if you don't read it, I'm doing you a favor by reading it to you. You're welcome. How you like me now? Again, you know. <laughs> Blessed is he who reads and those who hears the, or hear the words of this prophecy and keeps those things which are written in it for the time is near. Reads, hear, keeps. Reads, hear, keeps. This was meant to be heard by all the churches 
that this, that this letter was written to. And then he says, I'm going to skip this to this in verse 9. Because I want to get quickly to the context. And then I just want Jesus to be the center of it all again. Verse 9, he says this. I, John, and you know this is John the Apostle, the one who walked with Jesus. Okay, for along with the other 12 disciples for three, three and a half years of Jesus' earthly ministry. This is the same John that in his own book or in his own gospel, he refers him to himself as the one whom Jesus loves. Right? And at the, the Last Supper, it seems like he was the one nearest to Jesus, like a little brother just reveling in the love of an older brother. It says that he's laying down, he's laying even on his chest. That they had this unique friendship and bond of love as brothers in that season. And yes, as disciple and, and teacher and rabbi, but at the same time that there's this unique bond of love between John and Jesus. And this is the John that's writing the book of Revelation. I don't want you to lose this in your mind because John has a very specific image or images of Jesus before he's about to, to explain to you that all of his theological categories, all of his circuits are about to be blown by what he's about to share in these next passages because G John was one of Jesus' best friends on the earth. And so when he's writing this, you have to know that this is the beloved disciple. That's how he was described. Even in his own gospel, he's described as the beloved disciple, the favorite one. And when he's writing this, he's writing this, and we'll get into this in a little bit, as probably in his mid-80s, late 80s is what they think. And he says, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're new and you don't know why he's on the island of Patmos, the island of Patmos wasn't like Hawaii, okay? It wasn't like where you go and he's older, so he's ready to retire. He's 85-ish years old, and so he's like, well, I'm just going to go chill out on the Isle of Patmos. No, why he's on the Isle of Patmos is because Patmos was designated by the Roman Empire as a prison for political exiles in particular. Not just your random run-of-the-mill criminal, but, but enemies of the Roman Empire whose voice the emperor wanted to silence. Because these were the ones who were accused of fomenting rebellion against the Roman Empire. And so why John is on the Isle of Patmos is, that, and just for your notes or whatever, you don't take notes, whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, this is most likely written in 96 AD. Some people think 92. It's more likely to be 96 AD. This is the reign of Domitian, the Roman emperor at this time, who is considered one of the cruelest emperors towards Christians in particular. You know that the first Roman persecution or the government-led persecution happens in the 60s or 60 AD, that time frame, under Emperor Nero. And you know, he's the one who dipped Christians in tar and lit them as human torches. And persecution breaks out against the Christians from Nero's time into Vespasian into Domitian. And so when John is writing this letter to these seven churches, he's writing them in the context of Domitian's reign. And here's why this is important, is what most likely and what church history tells us happens is around this time, Domitian describes himself and he restored the traditional Roman religion and exalted himself as Caesar to the pantheon of the gods that the Romans worshipped. And what he described as his self-proclaimed title was Domine et Deus. I took four years of Latin. It just means Lord and God. A mere mortal describes himself as Domine et Deus, as Lord and God. 
And in one way of reestablishing this Roman worship, one of the things that he wanted to do in reestablishing this Roman identity was that any time that someone wanted to do business dealings, when they would come to the Roman temples, one of the things that they would have to do is pinch, uh, take a pinch of incense, throw it on the altar, and declare Caesar curios. In other words, Caesar is Lord. And what church history tells us is John refused to give honor to Caesar as a mere mortal who he viewed as a usurper who he knew only Jesus occupied the rightful place on the throne. John would have paid taxes to Caesar because Jesus said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. He would have on, maybe you can talk to Johnny Wilde if you want to get out of that, but you know, not in legal ways, but, but <laughs> over there. He would have honored Caesar because when Peter writes, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, one of the things that Peter says in the reign of Nero, the emperor, he says to, to the church, the Jewish peoples, he says, honor the king. Honor the Caesar. And something of a countercultural religion is born even in those moments that in the greatest hours of persecution, the apostles are commanding the church to honor the king. But what John won't do is he won't bow the knee to Caesar as God. And so what, what's happening here is you know, historians will tell you that minority movements are reignited or renewed or ignited by martyrs. And Domitian doesn't want to create a martyr through the old man, through Apostle John. So instead of killing John, he banishes him to this island called Patmos, which is about 10 miles west off the coast of Turkey today. I've done the seven churches tour twice now. And every time I've asked, hey, take me to the island of Patmos. And the waters apparently between the coast of Turkey near Ephesus trying to go to Patmos are some of the choppiest waters. That no tour guide, and I tell, I'll pay you double, I'll pay you double. No tour guide, they're like, no, it's not worth it. You'll feel sick the whole way. There's nothing to see there. It's just a rock. I know you Christians always want to see the island of Patmos because John apparently was over there. But I'm telling you, there's nothing to see. I'll pay you double. I'll pay. No, they never, never want to take us there because of how choppy and treacherous it is to get to the island of Patmos. But that's where John finds himself in the book of Revelation when he receives this revelation or this unveiling, this apocalypse, this disclosure of Jesus Christ, and he writes this in verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last and what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. These are seven real churches that would have been at the front of John's mind even as he was exiled on the island of Patmos. You know, the thing that really touched me actually this, this morning as I was reading through this passage again was in verse 10, it says, I was in the Spirit. And what does that mean? I don't even know. I just want to be in the Spirit, right? I was in the Spirit, but he says, on the Lord's day. Do you realize John is by himself as a political prisoner on this island of Patmos, probably separated from all other believers, and it's still because it's the Lord's day, John finds himself worshiping. I'm not, I know I make a lot of comments like this, but, but can I just say, for some of us, we have not even paid a price like John had to pay, but he still came together with the church around the world to worship on the Lord's day. 
He found himself seeing Jesus in a particular way, but not just Jesus, but the brothers and sisters that were found in Ephesus, in Smyrna, in Pergamos, that were found in Thyatira, and Philadelphia, and Smyrna, and Laodicea. He didn't draw back from the church in that moment. His, that was probably on his mind. He was probably even crying out to God while he was in the spirit on what was going on in the churches who would have definitely been confused, and they would have felt abandoned, and they would have felt devastated by Domitian policies as the emperor overseeing the Christian, you know, uh, persecuting Christians while overseeing the Roman Empire, they would have felt so confused. What is going on? Prior to that, if you read the book of Acts, the church was continuing to grow even in the midst of religious persecution. The persecution of the Pharisees and the Sadducees in Jerusalem and, and the surrounding synagogues But it wasn't until Nero, in in around 60 AD, when the government begins to unleash its reign of terror against the Christians. Trying to stamp out any vestige of love for Jesus. And it's during this time when, when John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard saying behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and what you see... Write in a book and send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia. Again, to a specific, specific people at a specific time. In verse 12, and this is what you have to understand. Twelve, five different times John is going to say, I turned and I saw. Or I turned and I looked. More than 19 times... There's a command in the book of Revelation. It's the number one command in the book of Revelation, which is to look, to see. The second most repeated command is fear not. Can I tell you, the only way that you're going to fear not is by looking, looking at the right person. And when John turns and sees, it's five different times that John turns and sees. In other words, it's five different windows that the Lord opens up for John to to see Jesus in a different light. And having turned, I saw, then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band, his head and hair, were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance, or his face, was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. I want you to catch this because when John turns and sees, you got to remember again, I already shared this, but, but John had walked with Jesus and knew his voice. You know, your best friend's voice, you always remember. Wherever they are, they call you. They say, hey, Brian, you know, this is my best friend. I know who it is. Doesn't even have to announce himself. But when John hears the voice of Jesus, there's something that happens where not even John, one of Jesus' best friends, can recognize who it is that's speaking to him, who's saying, listen, I am the first and the last. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the one that, that stands here, is the one who later he'll tell us will take the keys from death and Hades. I am the one. And John has no idea who's talking at this moment. 
He has no idea. He just says his voice sounds like a trumpet. I know some of you are bothered by how loud I talk. Tough luck. Jesus' voice sounds like a trumpet. Get over it. How you like me now? Anyways. He says his voice is like a trumpet and he's declaring these things. And John is so stunned by this message that he turns around to see who it is. And then all of a sudden, his friend Jesus, it's like Superman, you know, it's like Clark Kent, Superman. He like unveils the fullness of his glory to John in that moment. And suddenly John is looking at this man who he walked with for three and a half years. He thinks maybe I know who this is, but suddenly he looks so different than what he looked like. He wasn't just a Jewish man from Nazareth, though he's always still a Jewish man from Nazareth. He's suddenly different in his eyes, and he describes him this way. He says he's, this is the first thing he says, he's standing in the middle of the seven golden lampstands, which later on you know are the seven churches. If you wondered one of the things that Jesus is doing right now, yes, he's the one that's seated on his throne, but from time to time you can imagine he's coming in to see what the churches are saying about him. To see what the churches are doing. Do you realize that veil between heaven and earth is so thin that even if we can't see him with our natural eyes, there's always the possibility that he's in the room, that he's walking amongst the seven lampstands. He's nearer than you could ever imagine. And he sees him as walking in these, the, amongst the burning lampstands, and he's standing in the middle of them. It says in, in, in Revelation chapter 1, verse, verse 12, and in the, in the middle of that, it says, in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. I read one scholar, a German scholar, who said, this is probably the most pretentious title someone could have given in the early century in the ancient Near East. This could have been one of the most pretentious titles unless it was fitting for a king. Because Daniel chapter 7 tells us that the one who is like the Son of Man, who looks like the Son of Man, that this one is the one to whom belongs an everlasting kingdom. That his kingdom is going to come and it will never be taken away from him. That he's the only king that will remain eternally king. And so when you read that John is saying one like the Son of Man, you have to understand he's not confused by what he's saying here. There's almost over 500 references to the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. Over 500. If you think the Old Testament doesn't matter, you can't even understand the book of Revelation unless you understand the Old Testament. 500, more than 500 different references to the Old Testament. And this one comes from Daniel chapter 7 when Daniel sees thrones set up in the heavens and he sees one like the Son of Man coming to the Ancient of Days. This is the King Eternal. And he says this, he was clothed with a garment down to the, high, to, down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. This is the garments that only the high priest wore. And so when John is seeing Jesus. He's recognizing him, not just as any man. This is the high priest who takes away the sins of the world. Not only is the garments of a priest, but the garments of a king. So he's both high priest and king when he's wearing this garment down to his feet or this robe down to his feet. It was only a a, 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 fashion statement, so to speak, only fit for a king. And he's, when he's wearing this golden band around his chest, the priest would first place it around their waist only to move it to the chest when their work was finished. And so when Jesus is standing before John as both high priest and king with this golden band around his chest, he's saying, it is finished. The work that I've come to do, it's been accomplished already. Never having to be done again.
His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. In Daniel chapter 7, the ancient of days, his hair is described as white like wool, white as snow. And what you understand is the father and the son are of the same essence. They're they're together. My son over here, handsome boy, looks like me. Handsome, right? (laughs) And in the same way, the father's son, he looks like him. See, it wasn't lost to John or lost on John that it was the ancient of days, the father on the throne whose hair was white like wool. So when John sees one like the Son of Man, also whose hair is like wool, he knows this is the Son of the Father. And there's something ancient and wise, right? White hair or gray hair signifies wisdom. All wise is the one that John is witnessing. It says his eyes like a flame of fire. Can you imagine looking into a man? And, and you got to remember, John doesn't even have categories to describe what he's seeing. He doesn't say his eyes are fire. It's just something like a fire. His eyes, you know, his hair isn't wool, but it's something like white as wool. White as snow. He's just trying to get us as close as we can to what he was seeing. It says that his eyes were like a flame of fire. Can I say, Jesus has burning passion inside of him. His eyes are on fire because his heart is on fire. Deuteronomy tells us that he's a jealous or passionate God. Not a God without emotion and not a God without feelings, but a God who has deep love and deep emotions for his people. And so when John is seeing him, he's locking eyes with a man whose eyes are full of love, fiery love for his people. Not just eyes of love and desire, but also eyes that purify. That can penetrate through. Can can I say this? It's not that he loves us because he can see us and that one day we're going to, you know, transform into his image. He sees you and me right now in all of our messiness. His eyes are so penetrating, so piercing that they can see through it all. And he doesn't love us in spite of what he sees. He loves us even though he sees us clearer than anyone else can see us. Clearer than we can see ourselves. His eyes are like a fire. His feet were like fine brass as if refined in a furnace. Here's the thing. In Daniel chapter 2... When Daniel sees, or Nebuchadnezzar actually sees this statue, and then Daniel then sees the statue in his own dream and interprets it for Nebuchadnezzar, the statue that Nebuchadnezzar sees is his feet are made of clay, meaning your feet are on sinking sand and your kingdom is about to crumble. But when John sees Jesus' feet, he sees feet that are burnished like bronze, refined in the furnace, meaning they're so strong and probably hot is the way that the commentators will describe it, that everywhere Jesus goes, he burns away what's not of him. But he's established. He's not going anywhere. And his voice as the sound of many waters. Again, his voice like a trumpet, His voice as the sound of many waters. Here's the point. His voice has the ability to rise above the cacophony or the the rhetoric, the resounding rhetoric of our culture today. The world might think because we're the loudest 
or because we're pithy and because we're winsome or because we're clever that we're able to convince you of something. But can I just say, his voice sounds like many waters. It can pierce through the confusion of our day. There's something of thunder. I I, I remember I was in Paraguay and Brazil on the border of Paraguay and Brazil and there's this waterfall called the Iguazu Falls. Anybody been there? Wow, cool. Only guy. Considered one of the most beautiful sites in the world. And I remember just going down the stairs. You could start from the top and start walking down. When you get to the middle and the waterfalls are just thundering, there's nothing else that you can hear. I mean, I'm shouting to my friend next to me and he can't hear me at all. His voice can pierce the culture of today. And it says, and in his right hand, seven stars. In his right hand, he had seven stars. The son of my right hand, the son of my favor. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 110, he says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. At the place of favor, you find the seven stars, which he describes later in this chapter as the seven angels or the seven leaders is how most people understand that. The seven leaders of the churches. In other words, all that's going on in the churches, Jesus is intimately aware of and in control. Can I tell you, We've been through a lot of transition as a church. We've been through a lot. All churches have been been through a lot during these last two, three years. Can I just say, Jesus holds the churches in the palm of his hand, the place of his favor. I read that again this morning, and I felt overwhelmed. I I felt overwhelmed, even as, as a church leader, thinking, Jesus, you can hold me in the palm of your hand. just want to say, Jesus is about to bring some serious correction to these seven church leaders and these churches. At least seven warnings, at the very least. But can I just say, be careful how you talk about leaders in the church. I'm not even talking about just pastors. I'm just talking about the people who God has given authority in churches to lead the people of God. Because Jesus holds them in the palm of his hand. He holds these seven stars. And it says, out of his mouth, when a sharp two-edged sword, it can pierce through any confusion. It can separate flesh and spirit. Out of his mouth can come a sword that can cut through all confusion. And then he says, his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. His face is overwhelming. And the beauty of it spills over to his people, is what John is explaining. The sight shining as bright as the sun. And then here's what happens. John knows that this is Jesus now, because Jesus declared, I am the first and the last. I am the Alpha and the Omega. He knows this is Jesus. And he says, but when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But when the prophets of old, and even John is one of the last books that you'll find in Scripture, is that when they saw Jesus, they weren't like, wow, you know, he drew me in and he hugged me and he did all these things. No, when they all saw Jesus, all of their categories and all of their circuits were so blown that the only thing they can do is, you know, it's like just fall over as dead. It's not like this cavalier kind of understanding of who Jesus is. They're seeing him as the risen Lord, as the man whose hair is white as wool, whose eyes are like flames of fire whose mouth comes out a double-edged sword, whose voice sounds like many waters. They're seeing him as he rightly is right now. Not as we imagine that he could be. Can I tell you, John probably had categories of what Jesus was supposed to be like, about who Jesus was supposed to be like. He remembers him when he fed the 5,000. 
And he multiplied five loaves and two fish. He remembers when he went to the widow of Nain and he, su- she sudden- he suddenly raises her dead son up from the ground. He remembers the tenderness in which he looked at the woman caught in adultery. He remembers the woman at the well being so startled by Jesus' prophetic heart. And he would have marveled at Jesus' miraculous power and gentleness in dealing with the woman with the issue of blood. See, John would have had categories for Jesus that you and I, we could never even understand the intimacy that John had and revelation that John already had. I mean, not only that, even after Jesus is gone, that memory sustains him so that when he's commanded to bow the knee to Domitian and refuses it, he knows that there's someone greater because he'd walked with him. He saw him risen. He saw him ascend. I mean, can you imagine? It says, you know, 500, they saw him ascend. It actually says, and some still doubted. Can I just tell you? You might judge people. I love the Bible's honesty, but you might, you might judge people who... But, but can I just say, even the Bible says, they saw him rise and doubted. John saw Jesus rise. He didn't doubt. Because 40 days later, when the Spirit is poured out on all flesh and he's taken before with Peter, before the Sanhedrin, he's not afraid. He's not afraid of what they could do to him. And suddenly John is building this secret history and public history in God all throughout the decades. John's building this. I I want to encourage you, especially young people in this room. It's not just what's seen. Can I tell you probably for 60 years, John is living with the memories that he has of who Jesus is, but not just memories. He has intimate knowledge still of who Jesus is because he communes with him. He's the one who writes, you know, the the passage in John 14 and 15 when he says, abide in the vine. Like this is John's, you know, revelation of Jesus. What John's understanding of who Jesus was and what he had heard. And so when... When John is the one that's getting this vision, you want to lean in a little bit. And you want to pay attention to what he has to say. And he describes Jesus, and it just sounds like all this, you know, like weird, you know, how do you, eyes flame of fire, white like wool. I don't know if I find that super attractive. But anyways, it's supposed to be. And you're a little bit confused there. But when you see what John sees, you're supposed to see Jesus in all of his splendor. And what happens is that John falls down as a dead man. Despite all the categorical knowledge that John has for Jesus, he can describe to you all the details of the life of Jesus, right? Because John is even writing about the incarnation. He writes about his life. He write, and not just the incarnation. John talks about in the beginning was the word. No other gospel writer writes what John writes. John knows Jesus' preexistence. John knows Jesus' incarnation. John knows Jesus' life. John knows Jesus' ministry. John knows Jesus' miracles. John knows Jesus' death. John knows Jesus' burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and that he's going to return one day soon. He knows all of these things about Jesus, and he's teaching them to us through his gospels, through his letters, through the letter of Revelation. He's teaching us all of these things, but when he sees this man, he falls down as a dead man. Can I just say, as cavalier as we are about Jesus, we have no idea who we're even talking about. We are in for the shock of our lives. We have no idea. I remember, and I told this story. I remember in a couple years back, maybe 15 years back, we did this eight session series at our end of the year conference in Kansas City called Jesus, Our Magnificent Obsession. And Mike Bickle, I think he did eight, 10, 12, I don't even know how many sessions on just the person of Jesus, theology of Jesus. 
And I remember between the last two sessions, we took a 15-minute break. He walked back to this trailer that we were in because we were in this big auditorium. So we had these trailers where he would prepare. And he just sits down. I mean, he just did nine sessions or whatever straight on the person of Jesus. He talks longer than me, okay? So just like 20 hours probably. And I remember he, he doesn't even like see us the rest of us in the chair. He just goes straight, sits down in his chair. He t- takes his highlighter. He bites the heck out of a highlighter. And he starts chewing it. And he has this goofiest smile on his face. And he just, like, he's not paying attention to the rest of us. He's not talking to us. He's not saying anything. And then all of a sudden he just says, we have no idea who we're even talking about. We are in for the shock of our lives. He's not saying it to me. He's not saying it to anybody. I don't even know. Maybe there's like an angel. I don't know what he's saying. Who he's saying it to. He's just saying, we have no idea who we're even talking. I think sometimes we come to Jesus and we're so cavalier and we think we know all about him. And I'm just saying, yes, you can have an intimate relationship. I'm not saying these things. But the knowledge of God is inexhaustible. Knowing Jesus as our magnificent obsession will be a lifelong pursuit. That we will always have, to, we will always just find ourselves on the edge of the ocean, never having even fall, gone into the deep waters yet. The increase of his government will know no end. You know, the, NASA sent up a new telescope, you, you heard this, called the Webb Telescope. I just looked at the pictures and I marveled. At creation, it could, it could see further and clearer. You know, Hubble, they had to put the wrong lens on, you know, science, whatever. Uh, they put the wrong lens on math, you know, whatever. doesn't matter. And so they couldn't see as clear. They, they send this other telescope up, and you can see so clear. They're seeing all this. And what I remember hearing this one science nerd talking on the radio or podcast, like truly a nerd. He was like, you know, what's so crazy is the universe, it's still expanding. You know, it's like... And I'm thinking, I already knew that. The Bible told me that. The increase of his government will know no end. We don't even have real categories for how to understand Jesus. And we get so bored with him so easily. We have no idea who we're even talking about. We're in for the shock of our lives. John falls down as a dead man at his feet because he has no idea. He has no idea. He's like, man, I thought I knew you. I mean, I don't know how quickly he saw him, you know. It's like I'm trying to think about it because, like, at what point did he fall? <laughs> like, he turns and he sees, and he sees him a lot. He does the scan clearly enough. Looks him up and down, but at some point, you know, it's like, he's out. But then you know what the next thing that happens is? His friend puts his hand on him, and he says, don't be afraid. I'm the one you knew. When I say we have no idea who we're talking about, we're in for the shock of our lives, I'm not minimizing your history in God. I'm, all I'm saying is there's more. There's more of who he is. We're too easily satisfied by what little revelation that we have of who he is. Give to us a spirit. We pray this prayer, Ephesians 1, 17. Give to us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of the Son. And we get so bored so quickly with praying that. We don't even know who, we haven't even touched the outer fringe of who Jesus is. We're in for the shock of our lives. I want to end with this. Because I skipped this part when I read it, but he says in verse 4, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, he says, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ. Who gives himself three titles. The faithful witness. Meaning he was the one who was faithful even unto death. The faithful martyr. 
the firstborn from the dead. He's just the firstborn. There are sons of glory that are going to follow him. And the ruler over the kings of the earth. See, the book of Revelation, again, is written in the time of Domitian. When Domitian has set himself up as Domine at Deus, as Lord and God. And calling all of the Roman Empire to worship him as divine. And it's even in the middle of that, that John... Here's the thing. Why don't you catch this? When John is writing from the Isle of Patmos in the year on the Lord's Day, while Domitian is ruling and reigning, you might think that this is not how it's supposed to work or how it's supposed to go. And John is peeling back the curtain to say, what you see with your natural eyes isn't the end of the story. So many times we're so captive to our present circumstances, not realizing what the book of Revelation is trying to communicate to us, that there are unseen, invisible realities. Even though you can't see them, they're still real. About the present and unseen realities concerning the future that we're supposed to pay attention to. And what we see in in this book, when John writes this letter, he's trying to take the scales off of our eyes to see Jesus rightly. And he's writing it to these seven churches, but then he says this, ruler over the kings of the earth. Can I tell you, I don't, this is, not a political statement, but maybe it's a political statement. Not meaning to be first. Can I just say that Godhead is not on the throne concerned or surprised by what's going on down here? They're not disturbed. They're not challenged. They're not troubled. Psalm 2 pulls back the curtain even more and says, He sits in the heavens and he laughs. He's so at rest with what's going on. I'm not saying you shouldn't get involved in all these things, but John's answer to the problem of demission, to the problem of persecution, to the problem of compromise in the church, to the problem of of shallowness or superficiality inside of the church, isn't to add a program and say, how do we deal with political terrorism against the church? Or how do we, how do we deal with, um, you know, create a new program and we got to make better disciples and we got to do all these things, you know, and we got to create some. No, all John does or all John receives from Jesus as the solution to the dilemma that John finds himself in as a political exile on the Isle of Patmos is he pulls back the curtain and he gives him a vision of himself. He reminds John, this is who I am. This is who I am. And he starts with this. He says, I love this this language, this intimacy. He says, to him who loved us and washed us from our own sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Some of you in this room, you've never, you've never experienced him who loved us and washed us. Even as Julie was, was sharing, I thought my own life, I need Jesus to be the center. I, I should have raised my hand to be honest. It's so easy for me in my own life to move Jesus into the periphery of my life and not at the center. We're going to see in in future chapters or later chapters here that Jesus is the center of it all. He's the blazing center of all reality. 
And if we don't see him, nothing else makes all that much sense to us. Jesus reveals himself in Revelation 1. He gives to us a spirit of wisdom in Revelation here. But he first is the one who loved us and washed us in his blood and made us now kings and priests. And what John says is to him be all glory and dominion forever and ever. Let's just stand together. Tonight as we end, it's not about us. It's all about you, Jesus. We sang these words earlier. We're going to sing them again, I think, or something like that. But I want us to give an outpouring of love to him. Not what do I get out of this tonight, but Jesus be the center of all. We worship you. King of kings, Lord of lords. We worship you today. So Father, we look to your throne. We say our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Here in this room, your kingdom come your will be done in this room, even right now, as it is in heaven.